All right, welcome back to another Car Stories with Sung Kang and Amelia Hartford. Sung, it's my turn for the questions. All right. I got a question for you. Mm -hmm. Would you survive a zombie apocalypse? Thinking. Oh, would I? Thinking. Wow, that, that's a great question. Thank would you. I Would I survive a zomb zombie apocalypse like right now? Yes. Today, if it happened like in five minutes? Well, it depends on what kind of zombie. Are they fast zombies? Or are they slow zombies? I'm Do talking like Walking Dead zombies. Were they? They were slow. They were slow. Yeah. Well, I I would be. Yeah. I, I, I'm I not talking The Last of Us zombies. Okay. Okay. Um. Or or I Am Legend zombies that run super oh, fast. Oh no! Those, not, those no, zombies, no, no. The Walking Dead ones. The ones where they can't run, they could walk, but they'll well, eat your brains. I would say that I'm not prepared at home. Okay. Like I don't have like. Water survival reserves is okay. yeah, and sure. stuff. Actually, I do. Mm -hmm. okay. I do have a bag that will last me a month. Okay. Vin Diesel gave it to me. That's awfully nice. He gave me a like a survival bag. I okay. don't know if it's still good. I don't, I, I I don't think know. I think they last a while. So I have that, but I don't have any weapons. Okay. Because like, I don't, I don't have guns and stuff. Um, but. Like if so, if they were to attack my home, like they were, would, would I be able to survive? I think you're overthinking this a little. I would hope. What do you think? Well, how about you? Hell yeah, I would sur survive a zombie apocalypse. You would? Yeah, I would. What, what, what makes <laughs> you say that? Why so confident? I just, it's just my gut instinct. I feel like I have those um, uh, instincts given a life or death situation uh -huh. to pull myself out of it i don't know would you so if there was like two zombies coming in you would be able to chop their heads off because you know you gotta if i needed to sure they're dead so you would be okay doing that there's how zombies. would you do that though how would you do that depends we're here right now at the iheart studios yeah grab a knife out of the kitchen <laughs> but wait, there's no knife there we couldn't even find a fork for lunch <laughs> I found a knife. That's how I cut the sandwich in half. Yeah, a butter knife. <laughs> it was a steak yeah, but knife. You're not gonna kill a zombie doing <laughs> well, I can that. I could go upstairs. I could lock one of the doors. I could scale the side of the building. I could parkour to the next building. You would do that. I'd climb down to my car, my truck. But what about Teji? You would just leave him behind. We can take Teji. Yeah, no, no, he would be. He, he'd if be it was a female food. zombie, he would be trying to hump that zombie. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I would hope. I would hope I could survive, but. I thought about this before. I was like, what would happen if a zombie, zombies attacked my house and then ate and bit my wife and then she turned into a zombie? Mm -hmm. Would I just leave? Yeah. Or would I wait for her to be a zombie and then chop off her head? I love Tough that one. you've thought about this I, before. I, 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 yeah, <laughs> I think about all, a lot of useless stuff. Secondly, yeah. Why do you have to stay to chop her head off? Why not just leave? Well, I don't want her to go around and exist, right, as a zombie. But what if they come out with a potion or a formula to, to, one to solve day, that? Like, yeah. Well, she still has to go around and like eat people. Yeah, eat people, <laughs> right? I, w I would be sad. Like, what if, like, I'm. Like in the neighborhood, like, you know, breaking into people. You just people. casually walk in the dog. You see your zombie wife running by. Well, no, I would have to go get supplies, right? Like uh -huh. I would have break into someone's house to go get canned goods, right? You know, during the day. And then I see her like walking just like, oh, <laughs> right? The living dead, right? I would, I would be sad. Sure. So I would want to end her misery. Okay, I thought this was going to be a fun, like, <laughs> would you survive zombie apocalypse? And now I'm no, thinking about deep, what it, it would take to murder a significant other. Yeah, I mean, come on. <laughs> like, would you, okay, if you saw me and I was a zombie and you like, you were driving by me, would you just run over me to end my misery? Would you want would me I, to? I would hope you would. Then sure. You would. I'll, I'll crash. But, I'll squish your body so hard against that building with my truck. <laughs> you, you could do that? Well, yeah. You would do that? It'd put you out of misery if that's what you wanted. All right. Appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. Anyway, so. <laughs> Jesus. Uh, speaking of, I don't of know. What? There's no segue into of what? this. Speaking of kindness, of <laughs> ending friends' misery, one of the kindest people, I think, in the community. And I mean, it was just amazing to talk to this wonderful, wonderful hearted human being. Jeff Zwart. Zwart. Yeah. He is a. 
racing driver. He's a director. He's a artiste, photographer, videographer, you name it. I mean, he was just dropping words of wisdom. Yeah. Right? Just his um, you know, philosophy of people being passionate about what they do. You know, yeah. that's the beginning and that's the end, you know? So it's just a real privilege and honor to sit down with him. Yeah. And be able to just listen to his words. So, yeah. yeah. Without further ado, Jeff Swart. Now, for the listeners that aren't familiar with your career, um, you started in print for cars-related content, mm-hmm. and then you went into commercial directing, yes. and then you went into narrative film directing, yeah. right? Um, so how did you get your start in uh, like print photography? My fourth grade field trip yeah. in in uh, Delaware, we lived in Wilmington, Delaware, a fourth grade field trip. My parents gave me an Instamatic camera Instamatic. <clears throat> to actually go take pictures on it. So they did that. But, you know, funny enough, you know, as you grow up, you know, when when you stop wanting to be a fireman or an astronaut, you know, or these kind of all these kind of typical things, my goal was to be a, a veterinarian. You know, I was really... I loved animals. I loved that whole process of, you know, and I always had a dog. When I, when I was born, my dad went down the street. He was a sharpshooter in the Navy. Hmm. And when uh, when he, um, when I was born and came home, he took his rifle down the street and traded it for a dog to, to get uh, so that every boy, he in his mind needed to have a dog. Wow! And so I, from that point on, we've always had a dog. But, wow. but so dogs and animals and everything were so uh, kind of part of my life. And so naturally, the veterinary part was very interesting. But to wait, me. wait, wait! Why did your dad feel that every boy needed a dog? Because you, uh, cause cause he, he grew up with dogs too. Oh. Don't they say dogs are man's best friend? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think that's it's definitely, and it's also it's kind of. It's just nice to have a non-communicating relationship with something where you're not a verbal communicator with it so much. You just sense this wonderful animal is here for you, Mm. and I'm here for this wonderful animal. And we don't sit down and have long talks about things or (laughs) share things, but there's a communication and a relationship that develops that is just pure Mm. it's like you know right now you know we live in colorado and it's just wonderful to just watch the dogs go out and be dogs every day no fences no anything and you just sit there and you kind of look at that dog and go what's going through his (laughs) mind or her mind or whatever i just i don't know i I really like that so the veterinary side was really Mm. kind of to help dogs you know Mm. that's a whole nother level Mm. and to be able to do that and i love the fact that the first veterinarians I work for, it's just, again, the dog doesn't come in and tell you what its problems are. You know, you need to look at it. You need to spend time with it. And even in the days of when I was involved in veterinary medicine, it was, you know, there weren't even a lot of testing and there weren't MRIs and there weren't all the things that we do for our dogs now. It was really more of just like looking and listening to the owners and you know, feeling things on the dog and just seeing where are the problems, what can we do? And kind of really very spiritual to kind of get in the head and the body of the dog to decide what to do with it. But mm. anyway, I, I, my plan was to go to veterinary school here in the United States, but then all of a sudden it looked like, oh, maybe it would be a little easier to get in the veterinary school in Europe. So I went to Germany. Got oh, off. that's a huge... Yes. Yeah. <laughs> It was it was a big it was a big I, deal. So this was you were how old? Uh, I would have been nineteen years. You're old. just like it's going to be easier to become yeah to go to a vet school or become a veterinarian. Yeah, because it's, it's very Europe. hard. It's very hard. In it California, just, yeah. was, at that time, one veterinary school, yeah. UC Davis, ninety spaces. I think it, yeah. was, it was easier for me to be a doctor than it would have been to a veterinarian. Wow. It was very very it's still hard. It it's still it, is yeah. hard. Yeah. Oh. And so, but there there were nineteen foreign students position. So I thought, well, I'm going to do, do that. I got off the train, well, flew to Frankfurt, took a train to Munich, got off the train in Munich. I stayed in a youth hostel and I went around 
Munich going to all the veterinarians showing up and they're saying, do you need an assistant? Because I decided that for the first year, I needed to go there, learn the language, do everything I could. And the only thing I really knew how to do was to be a veterinary assistant because that's what I'd done in the U.S. Mm. And so ultimately, I kind of went in a bigger circle around Munich and ultimately somebody knew another veterinarian that needed help and it was a large animal veterinarian and I started working for that a large, large animal veterinarian outside of Munich. And, but the thing that simultaneously kind of happened once I got settled into that was, as you can in Europe, on Friday nights, I would get on a train and take the train to somewhere else in Europe and go to a race because I loved racing. And here I was in Europe to get to see racing from Formula One, to sports car racing to whatever. And so I would spend Saturday and Sunday at the races and figure out ways to sit, sneak into the pits and do all those kind of things that you could do then. And what a, be close during to, that era to be able to go to races in Europe, yeah. I felt, God, what a what a time to be alive. Oh, it was. And it was Nikki Lauda and James Hunt yeah. and, you know, all those kind of great things, which I'll tell you a little funny moment relative to that. But, but I was literally, you know, with my little camera that I had kind of evolved from that Instamatic in fourth grade, I had a camera with me and would photograph the races and and be right there in the middle of things. And I just came to this realization that, you know, this is where I really wanted to be. I was allowed to be around cars. The people that were closest to the action were the photographers. <clears throat> so I thought, <clears throat> let me just be a photographer, you know? Let me try to figure that out. So I wrote my parents a letter from Europe after being there for about nine, 10 months. And I said, you know, I don't think I want to be a veterinarian anymore. I want to be a photographer. And, you know, you have to wait for that to come back. Now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so then the letter comes back and I open the letter and said, well, you know, that's going to be a really difficult life because my parents knew nothing about photography, you know, mm. as a career. I really didn't know anything about photography, but they just said, We'll support you, but, you know, if you're a veterinarian, you've got it kind of made, you know, you, you'll you be a doctor and all this stuff, but if you want to be a photographer, uh, you need to come back to the United States and need to figure out where you're going to go to school because we can't help you in that. And so that was my life change. And it was not because I love photography, but because photography was the way to be around cars. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, you know, so yeah. that that was really it. And as it turned out, you know, I did eventually really love photography. I did did all that. I just, in my head, the driving force was, this is my way to be around cars. You know? Do you think because you love cars and racing, you were able to capture in your photography the cars un in a unique way compared to other photographers that would just take a picture of a car? Yeah, racing? It, yeah. That, that was really true. And it still works to this day. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, there's so many subjects that relate to what you just said is that you know, I, it was the speed, it was the motion, it was the things like that to it that I was so attracted to. I was less interested in just freezing the car. I wanted the motion and things. And my highest aspiration was someday shoot something for Road and Track magazine, because that's what I'd grown up with my family, was this magazine that came every month. Well, of course, when I got out of Art Center, I thought, you know, if I could just do something. So the offices for Road and Track were in Newport Beach. And I went down to those offices and my first assignment was a cover with them. So it just, mm -hmm. it took off from there. But also I started covering Formula One for Road and Track magazine. And I'd go to the Brazilian Grand Prix and shoot the Formula One spotters guide and do all these things. But it was always about motion and action and blurred backgrounds and kind of creating it maybe more artful. Mm. And and funny enough, I mean, who would have ever thought along this career that somebody was reading Road and Track magazine and they're at a company that builds fighter planes and they call me up and say, "Can you um could you come up to our offices for a meeting?" and I come up there and they have all my Formula 1 work from Road and Track magazine. They're saying, we would like you to shoot our fighter planes like you shoot Formula One. And I'm like, how do I get in this situation? Ultimately, it led to me being uh, Martin Baker ejection seat um, 
certified, went through all the uh, training that you do basically to be a pilot. And I flew back seat with this little card I carried with me and F-18s and all, almost so everything cool. that way. And, and photographed fighter planes the way I did F-1. And it was just, you know, that was... Looking back on it, it's just kind of a magical moment. But Amazing. it came from road and track, came wow. from shooting the Formula One cars. Wow. So came from something that you were passionate yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, really. absolutely. What a great lesson. Absolutely. You know? Can you look back in your life and see everything connect? Oh, how God. You, yeah. That's a whole, the amount of full circle moments, mm -hmm. it, it still to this day gives me chills. Just it, around motorsport or whatever, you know. Um, imagine I get a call through my office that Ron Howard wants to have a meeting about a movie he's working on. And it was the movie Rush. Wow. And he yeah. says, well, you know, can we meet for breakfast? I, I really like the way you approach shooting cars and action and everything. He said, it, could we just have uh, a breakfast one day? And so I go down, I have uh, meet him for breakfast. And I'm sitting there, and I didn't know what he was working on, but I'm sitting there with Ron Howard, and then to get his perspective that says, um, this is about James Hunt and Nicky Lauda. Mm. And I go back to, I'm a veterinary, working for a veterinarian in Europe, in the pits at Dutch Grand Prix in Sanford. Shooting Nicky Lauda. Shooting Nicky Lauda and James Hunt. <gasps> it's like, wow. Ron Howard is a is a real special human being, huh? Yeah, yeah. I I loved his diligence in studying it. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. I got to. I did this table read for a film that he was going to potentially do, and it, we it, we never did it, and it, it put things into perspective, like meeting him. Like first, you know, I grew up watching him on Happy Days and, mm -hmm. and the Andy Griffith Show, yeah. right? And uh, Andy Griffith Show is a Black and white TV show. Yeah, <laughs> well, we have to put things in perspective. Yeah. <laughs> She's like, the huh? room. What? Read, read the room. <laughs> <laughs> I, I never watched it, but I know what you guys are talking about. <laughs> you should never watch it. Uh, <laughs> anyway, it's great TV. Great TV. Hey, but right now, it's like a little boy. Like he's, he's really the little boy of the local sheriff, right? And not. Uh. not. Um, but anyway, um, so we're in his production office and. Um, Beverly Hills, and uh, and then I went to the bath. I was like, "Hey, can I use your bathroom?" And he had a bathroom in his office. He goes, "Hey, you can use that one." And I'm using his toilet, and there was the there was an Oscar on the toilet, <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, "I guess this is what he thinks of what these actually are I mean." At the end yeah. of the day, it's yeah. really the experience, really, you know, that he values. It's like it, at the end, it's just a statue, right? Yeah. It was like one of those like. Full circle yeah, moments to absolutely. be able to work with this icon. And, yeah, yeah. It's, no, yeah. it it is, and I think that's that's you really need to appreciate those moments too, and it really puts things in perspective. Even for like, funny enough, I shot the first. I think I shot four seasons of GT Academy, mm -hmm. the the real. Really, real GT wow. Academy. Yeah. So, oh, yeah, so connective. Yeah, yeah. So, so you know, so here we are. You know, Amelia and I talk, thinking about that. You know, then the movie comes along. But you know, it's like I was living four years with a group of kids that basically had qualified by gaming to go to Europe, to England, and race at Silverstone and decide on a winner. And we'd put them literally on day one in a GTR. You know, <laughs> on Silverstone, and it was to watch the mental load, the physical load, the uh, the racecraft develop. All these things that would have to kind of all come together to succeed in that. It was a fascinating process. And then here you are, you know, coming <laughs> off the movie. It was just it. It's again a really fun you know, circle moment of, of watching that evolve into something that was bigger than we ever imagined in the mm. beginning. So. What were some of the characteristics that you noticed that stood out of the individuals that excelled? Mm. You know, even, yeah. I mean, that's a question yeah. through life, yeah, right? It yeah, really yeah, 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 it really is. It was, you know, it was, it was, it was kind of hard to watch sometimes because people were so serious there. 
the competitors mm. that were were so serious and tried so hard. And you know, it wasn't. You know, racing is so much a part of economics in a lot of ways. Today is racing, and there was no economics in there. You mm-hmm. know, you you qualified or you didn't. It wasn't the um, you know how you were bankrolled or anything. So, for them to arrive there, it was really kind of multiple great human interest stories of guys that are just living, breathing everything about it. Was you know basically in the hands of this one week-long event. The problem, and not the problem, because the game prepared them so well, but there was no consequence Uh, in the game mm. for them to get there. And I couldn't believe how fast the competitors would ramp up. They would go quick right away because they'd raced with no consequence Mm. to get there. And... Then the other side of it too was is that they would they would be able to manage the cars so often because uh, some of this part of this I would ride with them sometimes and film and do they and you just you know knowing what I knew their car control was so good and a lot of times it would come back to saying well I have so little physical feedback in the game that now that I'm in a car that extra feedback I have actually really helps. You know, I really understand it. It's it's obviously something you have to adapt to, but the ability to kind of ramp up and go quickly right away was always surprising mm-hmm. to me. Because mm-hmm. I remember in some of the beginnings, you know, some of these guys had never even driven a manual transmission. Yeah, You know, they qualified in the game, but they never had driven a manual transmission. And the things that they'd have to encounter and... and uh, deal with was really fascinating. The interesting thing that happens and happened within the TV show or the show we were doing was that it was kind of, it became more entertainment in this, as we went through the seasons, rather than pure racecraft and everything that you needed to do to be a racing driver. It needed to be a little more entertaining season after season. And I think that... Like a reality show? Yeah, yeah. And it became... Uh, probably the results were less pure to what it took to be a racer. I mean, when you bought that 914.6, it was the affordable Porsche. Yeah. But today, that's not affordable. No, I mean, it really, honestly, like the hardly anything <laughs> is really. But yeah. but yeah, it was my cheapest way to get into a six-cylinder Porsche. How much was that when you bought it? I think... Uh, $3,800 or $4,200, something like that. Wow. Oh, my God. The story, you know, we can get into it, but the story of getting that car is kind of very defining for my whole kind of world. I had a paper route, like, at 13 years old. And so my dad, my, my parents, my dad was a, a mechanical engineer who specialized in plastics, and my mom was a school teacher. So... It's kind of the environment. I was the only child. And so I kind of just, uh, you know, grew up in that kind of environment. But I had a paper out. And his deal was I had to invest half my money in the stock market. Hmm. Wow. And it was just, it was just kind of like, you know, in retrospect, I guess, just teaching you to be conscious of your money and hmm. not just like, you know, every month getting my little paycheck from my <laughs> paper out of spending it. So... It also allowed you to kind of research and what what would I be interested in investing in and things like that. And then uh, when I graduated from high school, the deal was I could buy my first car and because uh, I didn't have a car all through high school. And at that point, and I just, my dad had a early 9-11, and, which is kind of a fairly well-known story, but... But it was actually chassis number 35 911. It was a 901. So, like, this would be a revered, amazing car to own today. It just, for my dad, it happened to be the oldest, most affordable 911 he could buy at the time, which was also a used car at the time when he mm. bought it. Mm. And so, I love the sound of a six cylinder motor. And a 911, I couldn't get a very new 911 at the time for the same amount of money, but I could get an almost brand new 914.6. And so that's what I bought. So I bought a 914.6 and I still have it to this day. It's on display at the Peterson Museum. Wow. But the, the cool things too is that that car 
you know, who would have ever thought that car kind of provided so many life experiences along the way? Because I went off to college in it, you know, people who went to Art Center, College of Design, where I went to college, they still remember, oh, you drove that yellow 914.6 in those days. You know, I... um that's the color of my 914. Is it? I have a 914. Oh, cool. It's yellow, yeah. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah oh, well, that's, huh. that was a color, and I've, it's actually made me kind of, you know, I still really like yellow cars to this day. But but the thing was is, you know, like if you look at back to the life, it's kind of been the common thread in so many ways. And, you know, I went to college in it, and I met my wife in it. You know, I was a skateboarder. I, I was a longboard skateboarder, and... So I would be up in the hills in between classes in Pasadena at Art Center and skateboarding. And uh, I met my wife. She was one of the girls giving rides back up the mountain after mm -hmm. we'd skate down. And, you know, I was driving the 914.6 then. And and then if you kind of go years later, in 19, I'd already been rallying and doing things in, in the uh, U.S. Pro Rally Championship and racing at Pikes Peak and different things. But I had the opportunity to do a long-distance event uh, FI Marathon Rally, which was 25 days, 10,000 miles from Panama to Alaska, and trying to decide what car to do that in and everything because it was such a big deal. Well, I decided to build my 914.6 into that rally car that I could do it because that particular event had to be 1973 and earlier cars. That car being a 1970 worked for that, but I entered that car in, in Panama, but the cool thing is you had a service crew, and there were two people in my service crew, a guy who we had known from Vasek Pollock in the early days of working with Porsche with my dad, of having his car being serviced there. He was Spanish-speaking and English-speaking, so it was perfect for an event that went through Central America. And my dad was in the service vehicle. So can you imagine, like, the guy who made me invest money at 13 years old with the deal I could eventually spend the money when I graduated from high school, here he is following me for 25 days in the car that I had bought with that money that I got to invest. It was just like, it was so cool. And my dad wasn't one of those guys who had done a lot of things worldly and had done, he was passionate with cars, yes, but he just hadn't done anything like that. And he's immersed in this full-on international event, chasing his kid, driving this car that he'd, you know, motivated to invest in the stock market. And we finished second overall and had an amazing race and everything. And, you know, it was probably, if my dad could share it now, it'd probably be one of his great moments in life of doing that. And so that kind of you know, you just don't get that opportunity very often. And yeah. it was really something special. Wow. Where do you think you get that drive from? You say your father wasn't much of a a worldly traveler. Did you take that after your mom? A little bit. I mean, um, you know, if you look at the racing side of me and, uh, you know, racing at Pikes Peak, which is, uh, you know, a fairly daunting event and <laughs> with some consequence. You know, I, I remember growing up that... Uh, my mom was the one that had to go on the roof of the house to install the antenna because <laughs> my dad, <laughs> my dad was afraid of being, <laughs> being on the roof, you know, up high in heights and things. <laughs> but I think, you know, I think Amelia, to your point, is like it's um, it's also a little bit of an only child thing, you know. It's like I went to a different school every year till I was a junior in high school. I I did. It wasn't always because we were changing houses and moving and things, but my dad was in the plastics business, which was like a emerging big business. And so he was always getting offers to do things elsewhere and things like uh. that. But but that kind of having to do things for yourself yeah. and adapt to environments and to be um, kind of very aware of uh, you're on your own. Yeah. And you got to do this. And my parents were very supportive. It wasn't like I was, you know, on uh, in my own in that way. But, you know, as a kid, you know, there's a generation. You want to be taking command of it. You know, you didn't have a lot of friends because you weren't dropping into, or you weren't living a life where, you know, you had lifetime friends and things like that. I was having to constantly make new friends. This It's so fascinating to hear you say this because I 
doesn't sound like I went to as many different schools as you did, but in my uh, high school years, I went to a new high school every single year. Mm -hmm. And the, the traits that you're talking about of um, like, I fortunately I have the childhood friends who I'm still in touch with today, but constantly having to meet new people, almost growing up on, like on your own terms in a way. And, and it, there's just a certain element that at the time I didn't understand, but looking back at, it really gave me this grounding that it sounds like we share. Yeah, I can imagine that. And, and, you know, I think also the other thing that it, for me at least, and I mean, this is more career oriented, but it really spawned a lot of creativity, mm. you know, because sure. you had to, you know, we weren't internet bound. We weren't, you know, entertained naturally by technology. You had to figure out ways to be entertained. And, and you know, for for that, since I didn't, you know, I came home from school, I wasn't really hanging with my friends because I was new to the school, you know. So mm. I ended up being, I think, more uh, motivated to be creative and be self, uh, you know, kind of self-motivated to make something on your own because you didn't have that reliance. And And in a lot of ways, you know, if you look at going into ultimately photography and then directing is that I just, you know, it kind of comes back on you. You have to own it. Yes, in, in filmmaking, we have an amazing support system and all these departments that work for you, but it still comes back to, it's got to be your signature. It's got to be your vision. Otherwise, you know, you're your um, shelf life in the business probably isn't <laughs> that great. And I do remember the first time when I started visiting production companies that wanted me to direct, they told me flat out, you know, this is, you know, you got about a seven year shelf life in this world of advertising directing because, you know, it's a very much an on to the next, the new guys, the mm -hmm. new views, things mm -hmm. like that. But, you know, I'm in my 35th year of doing that. And, it's still just as fun and as exciting as it was in the beginning. And I think that, like I told you at the beginning of this, it's kind of like you you want to, um, you know, it, the, like I said, the good news is I've, I've been doing this for a long time. The bad news, I've been doing it for a long time because I also want to always have things evolve, always have things change, because that's what stimulates me the most now. That's really beautiful because a lot of folks, even myself, I catch myself, being stuck in the old ways, mm -hmm. right? And then it kind of, I'm, I'm just turning into the old guy. I'm like, these young whippersnappers, <laughs> right? It wasn't like that when I was young. Yeah. This, <laughs> Back in my yeah. day. Yeah. 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 I had the worldwide <laughs> and I can take it to another generation <laughs> for sure. So, you know, and it's, and it's funny because, you know, in the beginning of your career, you kind of, on you just want to be so focused and you want to just be, you know, uh, no outside influences. This is me. This is who I'm going to be. And then you have to kind of hand it off to being, okay, who around me is doing the cool stuff? You know, mm. I got to start being aware of that. Mm. And I think that that was one of the keys is I kind of handed off, handed that off earlier. Maybe I didn't hold on to just this, like, I don't care what anybody else is doing. I'm doing this. I, I really wanted to know, know what was going on. And it's almost like, you know, in the creative process, it's almost like a flip book. Like you want to go through a whole bunch of images really quickly and take what you think you saw, mm. not open up and study a picture and say, I'm going to do something just like that, but like flip through something and see these things all flash by and you think, oh, I think I saw something kind of cool. And then where's your mind take it? Wow, you know, that's great. Cool. So yeah. that you don't end up like just copying somebody, right, you know, right, you don't right. want to do that. I think. You know, one of my greatest um, compliments from my kids a few years ago was uh, she said to me, how do you stay so relevant? Mm. And I thought, well, that's pretty cool. But the reality is, I, you know, if I am relevant, you know, it's from people like you guys, from people like, you know, the race service guys or the whatever, you know, there's, there's so many people in our business that I love watching evolve. You know, I think that one of the, single important things, at least for me, is leaving room to be in awe of others. Mm. Beautiful. That's, yeah. mm -hmm. that's to me, I, I wish so many people, filmmakers and people that I see, knew how in awe I am of what they do. Mm. You know, because my crews are 60 to 80 people. I mean, you've been on 
it features you guys and you've seen all this. And I mean, like when you're on a feature, it's 120, 130 people, whatever. But I'm in awe of the guys that go out with two or three people and just do wonderful films, yeah. wonderful points of views, one of the things. And I take that influence into my own life all the time, every, every day virtually. But leaving that room to be awe in awe is so important as opposed to, I'm just this, and I'm that, I'm going to go out every day. No, mm. you know, mm. got to leave that window open. You know, it's like bad weather. You know, you, we're in a business of filmmaking of, of you got to have great weather, you got to have this. But honestly, bad weather has given me more opportunity than it's taken away. You know, the amount of times I've been filming and a wall of blacks coming this way and everybody's worried that we're going to have this or whatever the scenes it's created and the opportunities and even the motivation to move quicker and mm. get things yeah. done. Mm. It's all, it's, it's just cool. You know, it's like as a director, you want to control everything, but you have to respect the fact that there's so many elements as you don't have sure, control over. Sure. So. I mean, this is, the, I think this is something I really needed to hear. Same. Yeah. You know, you know, on a personal level and in terms of like, you know, career as well, because as I start, getting older, like I go, I wonder if, you know, I'm going to be like aged out of mm -hmm. like opportunities. And what you just said is like, it rings like, I mean, it's just great words of wisdom that I'll, you know, walk away with. And you know, it's like, okay, you know, root for the younger people. Right. And it's like, I think about it and I'm like, Hey, the fact that, you know, I was there early on and you can kind of like, you know, pave the way and then you see all of these great opportunities that other, you know, people of color are having, or you know, mm -hmm. Asian American yeah. men are having. It's like being all, yeah, right. Yeah, and it's absolutely. such a beautiful, positive way to, you know, like be present, yeah, right. And and still, and 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 it's not about you anymore. It's about like the whole, mm -hmm. you know. Absolutely, it's really beautiful. It's it's a handoff of competing, which is important in the beginning. Yeah. To collaborating. Yeah. It really, it's just, you know, it's a simple process that I don't think you realize you kind of have to go through, you know, in a way. And and I think that that's, you, you know, filmmaking is so definitive mm. in, in so many ways. And interestingly, my parallels, you know, if I were to just take from my racing side, the event of Pikes Peak, which is... You know, a mountain we race up. I've, I've raced over 20 years there. I've done well there. I understand the place. The place is home. But it's still so definitive. And it's one run on race day. It's a finish line that is at 14,115 feet. It's There's no pit stops. I'm there's smiling no... as you talk. I want to do this so <laughs> yeah. badly. Yeah. Pikes Peak is the dream. And you should. <laughs> you should. But yet... All those same variables we have in filmmaking of weather and crew and you know Time. budgets yeah. and and yeah. all these all this management goes into you know I'm under ten minutes racing there I'm one of the few people that are under ten minutes and it's like you got to put it all into that little package in the same way but it's definitive again you got to get to the summit no matter what and there's no second chances there's not like you mm -hmm. can't bring it back in the in the way in filmmaking we don't. Uh, in my entire career, I've never gotten to a sunset and said, you know, we didn't get everything. We need to come back tomorrow. That doesn't happen. Mm. That's In my world, that's a $200,000 fault. Mm. You know, you don't, mm. you don't just say, oh, didn't get it all. I got to come back tomorrow. That sunset, that thing, the day that's managed through your assistant directors and crew and everything else, it's all for that moment of being done at sunset. You know, we don't just start bringing out the lights when the sun goes down. Yeah. We don't have the chance of bringing the sun back up. All those things. And I love that pressure. And I think that's why my racing paralleling with my filmmaking, there is so many um, things in the process that I approach in the same way. But when, for, for instance, like, if you need to make your day on a film set or you need to get to the finish line and you don't make it, like, how do you like find peace with that? Because it's a 200,000 overage. Can I yeah? add to your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> because we're going on a path of a conversation we haven't had yet. You and I personally have been out on this podcast is 
also adding to Sung's question of what's your relationship with failure when that mm, comes. Good, good, yeah. You know, that's a that's a, a complicated one, I guess, because you know, it's kind of like in my head, failure is a big deal. You know, I I don't take it lightly. I want it to work. I can think of the moments of failure in motorsport, which is pretty definitive, usually because you've crashed or right. done something like that. And in filmmaking, it's, you know, you fret over scenes that you might have missed and you didn't have a chance to do it. But experience gives you confidence knowing that you have the best people to edit, the best people to finish these things. But but it's it's hanging over you. But, you know, you want to be, in general, you want to be in a proactive position, mm. not a reactive position. Your experience is going to give you the opportunity to be reactive, but the more you can plan and be proactive, it creativity comes out. Creativity is in two areas. Creative, pure creativity is being aware of the moments you're filming and working on to enhance it in the best possible way to tell the story, both visual and from an editorial standpoint. But there's also creative to the solution. You know, your experience of, I can creatively make this scene work even though I don't have all the right elements there. So it's, it's a balance, I guess, in that way. But I guess the to your point, I, you know, fear of failure, you just don't, if you're fearing things in the process, creativity has a hard time coming out. Mm. It really does. It's like a blocker. You know, when you all of a sudden have to just be reactive, 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 you're kind of on your heels, you know, and you want to be on your toes. You want to be able to move forward and have the big picture of the way things go together. So I think that was a handoff also for me of understanding that I didn't have to be responsible for everything. I had some of the best people in the world operating in categories that I don't know much about, you know, and let them be that person. Huh. I mean, that that being able to relinquish that control as a creative is very hard, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. we were talking, Amelia and I were talking about that earlier, of like, you know, you know, do you when when something doesn't go right, then it all comes back on you. It but does. if you can relinquish it, you're like, mm -hmm. hey, you know, it's not just my fault; it's your fault. <laughs> 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 right? you know, yeah. I mean, that, that, that kind of helps you out a little bit, like to get through the next day. Yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> it does. It does to some degree, but ultimately, you're the leader. You're yeah. the boss. Yeah. You're you're the overall. You're the reason why it was hired. You know, you you started shooting. Basically, it was analog, right? Mm -hmm. um, and today, moving into CG and um, you know, with the LED screens, where AI. you don't even, yeah, AI, <laughs> right? A whole other thing. I mean, <laughs> do you think? I mean, are you as open-minded about that as well? Of like that pushing the like the the bar for you know action sequences with cars? Um, yeah, it's 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 really. It's really interesting. And again, it's kind of like, you know, we went, I started in film and you had 400 foot magazines, you know, and that, that ran for a certain amount of time. You know, it was like everything was based on changing film and things like that. You know, now we leave cameras rolling. We have yeah. multiple cameras working. And, you know, if in when even when I was at Art Center, I got into mounting cameras. I was mounting cameras on my skateboards, on biplane wings, on all sorts of things. And I just love doing that. And my first road and track cover was actually a camera rig on a car going down a road. And so it was like this time tunnel, blurry look. It really kind of showed action. And I love that. And, you know, now we're in the GoPro era and all things. Everything's gotten smaller. Everything's gotten more usable. And, and I think that, uh, you know, there was a moment in time, too, where changing over from film to digital, I shot with a different camera system every job. You mm. know, it was evolving so quickly. And the way things are evolving are, um, you know, it it's an opportunity, but in some ways it stands in the way. And mm. I was very much a person that 
I felt like I needed to be genuine to filmmaking, genuine to the car. I was in an area where I was a high action specialist. So generally I'd be shooting cool cars, you know, that were truly capable of that. And I always felt like if they needed to go into special effects and different things at that time, it was kind of taking away from the, you know, believability that that car could really do it. So my goal was by working with people like Reese and Tanner and Paul Dallenbach, these guys that could put a car anywhere and do everything, with, I wanted to really show the real action. I really wanted to be part of that so that if you ever pulled back on the curtain on it, you actually saw it happen. You know, there was a genuine nature to it. I was fortunate to be shooting a car that was genuinely capable. Let's film it in a way that it's really doing those things. And so, again, it's up to you as a filmmaker to put cameras in places. I wanted to not just watch a car. I wanted it to make you blink, hmm. to feel like <laughs> it was going to hit you or defy logic or do things like that. You know, it's like, like I said, as a filmmaker, I want to be on my toes. As a viewer, I want to be on my heels. Like, Mm. whoa, you know, this Mm. is it, you know? Mm. So, so I look at what's happening now and obviously AI is going to be a whole nother category things, but it had, there was a moment in time where effects and plates that we would shoot and all these kind of tedious parts of filmmaking ultimately didn't add up to as pure of experience of watching a car as I wanted. And so my goal was always to put that car on the edge. And it, as a director, I've spent 20 years of my life j- racing up the side of a mountain, putting wheels, half the tread on the pavement, half the tread touching the edge of the road, you know, putting those moments in precision on a mountain with huge consequence. But I want, you know, that perspective plays out in my own filmmaking because I'm already looking at things that way. I have a funny handoff. Like, I run the Colorado Hill Climb Championship, which is dirt roads up the side of a mountain in a GT3 cup car. It's raw, it's pure. It's a bunch of old timers who quit racing at Pikes Peak because it got paved. They just all want to be on the dirt and stuff. I will pitch a car in the corner, rotate the car, drive on the throttle. I'll feel that right front wheel just bound a little bit over a rock or something in the corner, and I feel it go light. I feel it touch back down. And all that moment, and the attitude is just right. The wheels are set. You just can feel the outside wheels tearing at the earth. All this stuff's happening. My head will go, oh, I hope somebody's out there with a 200 millimeter lens. Yeah. <laughs> and roll it, roll it. Yeah. 120 frames a second. Yeah. Because that would be a great shot. Yeah. You know? yeah. Yeah. So, and then I do that. And yeah. it's funny because lately at Pike's Peak, I've kind of even taken that a little more, uh, you know, to uh, my process is that when I do enter certain sections of Pike's Peak, I think about what it looks like on the outside. That's funny. And I try to put the car exactly in those moments, you know, and, and so it kind of is a, a fun play, but, but I guess to the point is that my perspective is already at the edge of the mountain. Mm. My perspective is already taking something to the ragged edge limit, that sort of thing. So I almost pick up in filmmaking at that point rather than build up to it. Mm. So it's it's that kind of perspective that I bring to it. And I actually think that my racing has fed the longevity to my career. Because if I sit in a client meeting and somebody's got some new hot car to talk about, I can put it in perspective of what that car can feel like, look like, and be emotional about it that they hopefully understand that this isn't just a job for me. This is a quest to share my passion with the rest of the world through filmmaking. Mm. You know, our friend Brian Scotto, who, Mm -hmm. you you know, Brian, right? Um, Who I feel like he is really pushing the envelope or I guess redefining like what, you know, how cars are shot, action sequences. 
And he coined this phrase. I don't know if he coined it or he borrowed it or maybe even look, stole it from you. <laughs> <laughs> but he has this he has this phrase called honest angle. Uh-huh. Right. Yeah. And he's like, and we were talking about because I was I always ask people, like, what do you think the problem with fast like action sequences from the Fast and Furious? And it's like, it's not honest. You know, it's like, yeah. you know, they're cool cars, but when a car is like going from like one building to the other to like outer bungee, space you know, to... or outer space, it's like it's that it's not honest. Yeah. And it's like what I'm listening to you is like you shoot the car honestly, like because yeah. you understand how the car would actually perform mm-hmm. in reality you were able to convert that, you mm-hmm. know, onto screen. And then the audience, it's a, it's, it, it is like a, you know, like, whoa, this is like, you know, a visceral reaction to Absolutely. it. Opposed to, oh, that's a special effect, yeah. right? And then it kind of just, you just yeah. kind of. Appreciate it less. It, yeah, yeah. Right. It's just, it's yeah. like, it's like, it's like junk food. Right. Yeah. It's just easy. Like, you know, it's like I don't know. You did say your favorite pizza was Domino's. <laughs> your <laughs> That's favorite not junk food. Is Big Mac. <laughs> not Jeff. No. no. no? What? No. Domino's I'm, pizza? I'm there. I'm yeah, with you. I'm with you. Is it your favorite I'm pizza in the world? World. Yeah. You know what? There's a certain <laughs> thing you give up in convenience, let's say. Okay. I'll give you that. I'll give you that. It's delicious pizza. <laughs> It's I good. Mean, it's I, good. I mean, stuff should taste it's good. like it a pizza. Good. Yes. So, <laughs> right. Okay. Um, anyway, let's go back. Well, well, I don't know whether Brian told you, but there is a directorial team known as Zwardo. Hmm. That's Jeff Zwart and Brian Scotto. Zwardo. We oh, really? we collected we directed Climb Kana together. Oh, and so when Ken Block which decided makes sense, yeah. to I go saw, to Pikes yeah, Peak, yes, yes, yeah. yes, so we we directed that together. Yes, and, to, and fun, it was fun because Ken Block, you know, what he did in a car, you know, the amount of times I would sit in a client meeting in Detroit or wherever, I say, you know, we want that, we want to see the kind of like that Ken Block stuff. You know, they they would refer to it or whatever, and. Ken was so good at putting a car on the edge and doing all that. So naturally, when this project came up and I was asked to direct with with Brian, I was just like, wow, this is so cool. And I learned so much in it, to your point of like, you know, this style and look and feel of filming. And, you know, Ken, I'd actually, I think I'd even raced with him at one point or things, but we'd been you know, certainly been around each other and seen all the Jim Connors and everything at that point. But what was super cool was Ken would have his opinions about the way we needed to film. Mm. And, you know, it's kind of like in your mind, you have a routine in the way you film and this is your process and stuff. And I started to understand why things were different in a lot of ways with the way Scotto had approached it and the way their teams had filmed Ken and then Ken's ideals. And one of the things was interesting because I always, my office is a Cayenne armed camera car with a big arm on the roof. And, you know, I go, you know, that that's my world and always tracking and doing moves and things. And, and Ken goes, I don't like those. I don't like, you know, camera cars. And I, I thought, well, you know, well, but it's okay. I know, you know, this is the way I work, you know, we'll have a camera car. But you started to realize that the moment the camera was traveling with his car, it slowed his car down. Mm-hmm. You know, as soon as you start matching speeds, right. things start to slow down. And you, I kind of knew that. I did know it, but I hadn't really applied it. And it wasn't until Ken kind of said, I don't like camera cars. I started to put the whole thing together. And stylistically, that's what I really liked about Jim Connor. And we always have conversations about what was the best one, which is the best one. We all look at different ones of which is best. But the first one that I ever saw, and this is when I'm well into my filmmaking career, I felt like I'd climbed over the fence and gotten into something that I shouldn't be there for. Mm. Such an got, interesting and, way and, and to And got put it. to record it yeah. and see something that like, let's just put that away before anybody catches us. Mm-hmm. You know, it was that kind of, that tension and everything of like, I'm in here, I'm going to get this, and then I got to get out of here because somebody's going to bust me. You know, that moment and spontaneity and the way that played out in front of you with them just ripping it up at El Toro Marine Base, you know, it was like, yeah. that was that was cool. And, you know, it, there were times where, 
it maybe got too polished or times where it got, you know, a, a little bit of away from that purity, but then it kept coming back to that. And and Ken also just developing as a driver, everything about it was such a great franchise. And, and without it really, um, you know, consciously affecting me, I just know that so much of their work played out in influencing me. And honestly, you know, a little over a year ago when I got the phone call that Ken had passed, it was when that really kind of all rained down on me of this guy was a huge part of my life, even though we weren't directly hanging out best buddy friends. The effect of my life, my industry, everything about it will... It, it really came to me at that moment and still affects me in that way. Yeah. Yeah, was, yeah. yeah. Speaking of that, you know, as one gets older in life and you're dealing with, and you deal with loss, right? I mean, I'm, there's something that I'm, I'm noticing. It's like, you know, every few months now I get a phone call and you know, someone is passing or someone is sick, you know, um, and it scares me. You know, it's like, it really, really scares me. And and I, I still don't know how to deal with it. I don't know if I'll ever know how mm -hmm. to deal with it. I mean, how, like, how do you deal with loss as you get older? You know? I got to say that within my family, at least, I've been very fortunate that I haven't really had any surprise losses. You know, my, grand, my grandparents were farmers and they lived in their 90s. My parents lived in the 90s, you know. There were no real kind of surprises within the family. I've certainly lost race driver friends along the way because that's, you know, it happens in the decades that I've been involved in racing and things. I've started losing some friends who, you know, we grew up with together and just lately. And I think that's part of it. I, I you know, having the perspective of what you've been able to do in your life and, and be part of and like I said before, being in awe of others and, and being inspired of others and and kind of keeping that going. I, you know, Ken was one of the more difficult ones because it was almost like you just realized you hadn't spent enough time. You hadn't taken it as seriously as maybe you should have of what that guy provided, not just for you, but for the whole car culture, yeah. all that sort of thing. So. It it is difficult, but I also savor so much, and I, I feel it's so important not to have regrets and and mm. feel like you've chased, you've been pure to yourself and chased your passions and been able to be constantly invigorated. You know, it's like um, perpetual motion when things feed something and it just keeps it going. That's that's the way I look at my career, you know? It's always been interesting. Every element has been interesting. Every day of the life has been interesting. I love going against the elements, you know? I love being provided challenges, even at this age. You know, I'm not looking for the easy path. It, it, not the worst day, but you know what I mean? I, I like the challenge. I love that fact that you are just going against life and and succeeding mm -hmm. you know and i i love to see that in other people and i i love the underdogs i love the people that have looked at life differently Th those kinds of moments just make such a dynamic engaging world because elements in life whether it be life or death or health or or weather or anything it's it's part of our life and you love to see people succeed in that. And and I, I that's the part that really kind of motivates me and other people is watching that. I, I love watching new filmmakers and people that haven't even been educated in school. And, you know, they've just done it on their own. I love that kind of vibrancy of of because the only reason for success in that environment is passion. That's it. Well, that's well said. That's yeah. really beautiful. Yeah. This, this has been a great conversation. It really too. has been, yeah. Oh, well. I feel like I'm going to leave this a better person. <laughs> <laughs> well, I agree. Uh, yeah. no, I, I, it's all for us. And I think that's the point of of 
our world is just that we can kind of feed off each other and 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 take advantage of the relationships in the best possible ways and 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 take away the good and understand the bad but that balance of understanding how important a life is around us to be able to come back to and share in it and live in it and give people space to be part of that mm. is so important mm. so wow. but Thank you so much, Jeff. Oh, yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thanks, you guys. And honestly, like, you know, going back to it, it's like, you know, you guys are my inspiration. It's a new generation of inspiration. And I I just leave those doors open to be inspired by others. But you guys are great. Love it. Thank, thank you. you.